The intertestamental period is a total mystery to most Christians. While many believers know that a four to 500 year gap exists between the end of the Old Testament and the time when the New Testament begins, this is only half the story. The last Old Testament book to be written, Malachi, was written between four and 500 years before the birth of the Messiah. However, many have yet to learn that a series of events fundamentally changed history and the world landscape during this time. These events were stunning, and when understood correctly, they show us the immense way that God was at work in the world, preparing the way for Jesus and the gospel that he would bring during the supposed silent years. This video will walk you through the four major historical events that make up the intertestamental period. Should you stick around for the entirety of this video, you will not only be amazed at the way God was at work in the world, preparing its circumstances for the coming of his son, but also you will have a better understanding of the world that Jesus stepped into and the place that he held within it. Event number one, Alexander the Great conquers the known world and introduces a common universal language. Famous Greek philosophers like Homer, Plato, and Aristotle spoke classical Greek. Perhaps the most advanced and eloquent language to ever be spoken, it was capable of precise and elegant expressions. Alexander the Great, the son of Philip of Macedonia, was tutored in Greek philosophy and language as a boy by the philosopher Aristotle. In 334 BC, he became the first world leader in history to conquer the entirety of the known world. To advance Greek culture and language and ensure that his empire would remain unified under his Hellenistic rule, Alexander made one of his mother languages, Attic Greek, the language of his empire. This was astonishing in its effectiveness and significance. The language spoken by Alexander's military spread quickly throughout the known world. As it commingled with other, less adept languages, it eventually became a more straightforward, quickly learned language called Koine Greek, or Common Greek. By the first century, Koine Greek was a language so common that people worldwide were adept at speaking it, and nearly everyone could understand it in some form or fashion. From modern-day Britain to Northern Africa and the Middle East, Koine Greek was the central communication medium across the Roman Empire. While many have pointed out that Roman elites, military members, and upper-class people spoke Latin amongst themselves, the vast majority of people in the world did not know Latin. Even in Egypt, where Jesus spent significant time with his parents during childhood, Greek had become the official language under the rule of the Ptolemies. As the adage goes, Rome may have conquered Greece militarily, but Greece conquered Rome culturally. This can be seen no more clearly than in the fact that the lingua franca of the first century was not Latin. It was Greek. To see how widespread and common the Greek language had become prior to the first century, one need look no further than to the people of Israel, who for the first time in their history had a prominent and widely circulated version of their scriptures being read in a language other than that of the Jewish patriarchs. Event number two. The Hebrew scriptures are translated into Greek. After the death of Alexander the Great, his empire was split into four separate kingdoms ruled by four of his generals. 
the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt and Northern Africa, the Seleucid Empire in Judea and the modern-day Middle East, the Kingdom of Pergamon in Asia Minor, and Macedon in the north. During much of the 3rd century BC, Egypt was ruled by a Greek pharaoh named Ptolemy II Philadelphus. He was the son of Ptolemy I, a Macedonian Greek general who had served under Alexander the Great. In the early 3rd century BC, Ptolemy II called for the Hebrew scriptures, also known as the Tanakh, to be translated into the people's language. You see, many of his subjects were God-fearing Jews who had fled from Judea after the fall of the kingdom of Judah to the Babylonians in 597 BC. Thus, many of these people now spoke Greek. 2 Kings 25, 26. Then all the people, both small and great, and the captains of the forces arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Along with the Jews who had already been living in Alexandria for around 300 years, many more began migrating to Egypt after the death of Alexander. This was due to the increasing difficulty of living under the Seleucid Empire in what had formerly been the land of Judah. By this time, two languages had become the prominent languages of the Jewish people, Aramaic and Greek. Aramaic became the language of those who migrated north and east after the fall of Judah and was more or less a combination of ancient Hebrew and Akkadian, the language of the Babylonians. This was the language of the prophet Daniel and was undoubtedly spoken by later prophets like Ezra and Nehemiah, and by those who returned to Judea and remained there after their deportation to Babylon. Those who had migrated south and west eventually began speaking Greek, which had become the common language of Egypt shortly after the rise of Alexander and was quickly becoming the most common language spoken in the world by the mid-third century. Ptolemy II ordered the translation of the Hebrew Bible into the language of his Jewish subjects, Greek. By this time, classical Greek had already evolved into a more accessible, simplified dialect known as Koine Greek, or Common Greek. While this version of the Greek language was much more straightforward than classical Greek, it was still one of the world's most descriptive and advanced languages. The Greek that is featured in the Septuagint, the first ever translation of the Hebrew Bible into a different language, and one that, as legend has it, was undertaken by 72 Jewish elders and scribes, is remarkably similar to the Greek that we can find still being spoken and utilized during the time of the New Testament, some two to three hundred years later. There can be little doubt that this Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible became prominent in the Jewish world a couple hundred years before the birth of Christ. There can also be little doubt that Christ himself read and was taught out of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This can be seen in the fact that Jesus is often seen quoting from both the Septuagint and the Hebrew Bible in the Gospel records. As many Jews in Egypt and the East were already speaking Greek by the middle of the third century, the translation of the Septuagint likely encouraged more Jews living in Judea, who probably spoke much better Aramaic than they did ancient Hebrew, to learn Greek as well. Event number three, the War of the Maccabees takes place in Judea, resulting in the reunification of many Jewish people and eventually to a second marvelous temple. 
The third historical event God used to prepare the world for Christ centers more specifically around the land of Israel, the territory known as Judea. Following the split of Alexander's kingdom, Judea was left under the rule of the Seleucid dynasty. The Seleucids were a Macedonian Greek royal family founded by Seleucus I. After several generations of Seleucid leaders who were more or less indifferent to Judaism, a leader arose within the empire who saw it partly as his mission to Hellenize his subjects. Antiochus IV, also known as Antiochus Epiphanes, banned the practice of Judaism in the land of Judea. He also simultaneously auctioned the Jewish high priesthood off to the highest bidder, which eventually became a Jewish priest named Jason. Jason discouraged traditional monotheism and promoted Greek culture and religion throughout the land. These actions by Antiochus resulted in two drastic repercussions. First, after the persecution of Jewish people by the Seleucids and their dignitaries reached its boiling point, a Jewish revolt was initiated in 167 BC by a priest named Judas, son of Matathias, who would later come to be known as Judas Maccabeus, or Judas the Hammer. An independent Jewish state was formed in 130. This independent state would last for almost 80 years, eventually giving way when Rome once again annexed Judea due to a power struggle between two Hasmonean brothers. Rome's restored control over Judea would set off another series of critical events. The appointment of Herod the Great as King of Israel, the subsequent rebuilding of the Jewish temple, and the transformation of a once out of the way Roman province into the restored center of Jewish culture and religion the world that Jesus would soon step into. As a result of the Hasmonean dynasty, many Jewish exiles, many of whom now spoke and read Greek, returned to the land of their fathers in the 150 years leading up to the birth of Jesus Christ. Event number four, the Romans build roads and highways all over the empire. The Roman Empire is known for many things. Its military might, governmental structure, and social institutions are among some of its most prolific achievements. However, one of the most underrated facets of Roman geopolitical success can be found in how they unified their empire during a time when the world was still a vast and arduously traveled place. Roman road building revolutionized the world nearly two millennia ago. It advanced the spread of Roman thought and language, but also created an incredible mechanism for which the gospel of Jesus Christ would depart from the land of Judea and quickly spread across the entire empire. Roman road building commenced almost three centuries before the birth of Jesus with the famous Appian Way. However, in the subsequent years, the Romans went from being ingenious road builders to masters of the craft. Roman roads were expertly engineered, incredibly durable, and built with the speed of travelers being of utmost importance. At their peak, the Roman military could lay down two yards of paved road per man per day, meaning that with a decent amount of manpower, a Roman road could be constructed with incredible speed. By the time the first century came around, the empire had over 
29 great highways emerging from the capital city alone. By some estimates, there was as many as 370 great roads connecting all parts of the vast empire, consisting of over 250,000 miles of roadway, including over 80,000 paved miles. Thanks to the success Rome experienced connecting their empire via a road system, the apostles and other disciples of Jesus were able to use these very roads to spread the gospel message throughout the known world in less than 70 years. Thanks, Rome. While many Christians believe that God was silent during the intertestamental period, history tells a different story. God was at work behind the scenes, setting the world stage for the coming of His Son. Thanks to a universal human language, a world power that built roads and highways connecting nearly every facet of their empire, and several other important world circumstances that trace their origins back to the intertestamental period, truly the world stage was set for Jesus and his gospel in a way that it had never been before. Truly the gospel was prepared. It was allowed to run swiftly, first throughout the land of Judea and then throughout the entire known world, thanks to the God who is sovereign over history and the events that he was orchestrating during the intertestamental period.